into computer studies. Uh, and so I don't want to speak too much because I want to get to our speech. Uh, but I think it's important to think about, I'm going to use the word impact a lot, the incredible impact that he has made. And what I find uh, most profound uh, is the clarity of our writing with the depth of thought. Um, and it really is um, a lasting legacy. So I chose to read a small quote from Left Out, The Politics of Exclusion, which was published in 2002. And it's a book that I first encountered as a graduate student at Tufts University. And uh, I think this quote really speaks to what we're speaking about today at the 25th anniversary conference, the notion of looking back to the forward. And it says, the past, it can be argued, even determine the future, unless we assume that it must. Insufficient courage, not inherent corruption, may be what places limits, narrows options. So this whole notion of courage I find incredibly moving and important. And I think it's this idea of courage that helps invoke the ideas that we're speaking about today, whether it's Elisa talking about activism and art and conversation, or Jonathan talking about history, um, or, or Lisa talking about intergenerationality and intersectionality. So uh, I hope that we can uh, think about that as we continue through the day. So Martin Duberman is a distinguished professor emeritus of history at the CUNY Graduate Center, where he founded and for a decade directed the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies. He is the author of more than 20 books, including Paul Robeson, Cures, Black Mountain, An Experiment in Community, and the novel Haymarket. Duberman's first play, In White America, won the Vernon Rice Drama Desk Award had two national tours, and was produced in London and Paris. Several of his plays, sorry, I lost my plays. Several of his, several of his national, several of his later plays, including Mother Earth about Emma Goldman and Visions of Kerouac about Beats, have had several productions. Duberman has won numerous awards, including the Bancroft Prize and the Lesbian Psychiatrist Prize, Land of Legal Defense, and the Whitehead Award for Lifetime Achievement in Nonfiction. He is also a finalist, or has been a finalist, for the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. In 2007, he received the American Historical Association's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014 for LGBT nonfiction. In 2012, Duran received a Doctor of Humane Letters, an honorary degree from the Amherst College. So please help me welcome the incredible Mark Duberman. And 
by the way, I hope you'll indulge me if from now on I use either the short forms gay or queer, though I am well aware of the ramifications of doing so, but hopefully you'll let me get away with it for at least an hour. <laughs> and anyway, I invited these, these friends and fellow scholars over to my apartment in order to talk about the pros and cons and possibilities of starting a research center uh, devoted to uh, gay and lesbian studies, uh, now more commonly called queer studies. Uh, the, the general thrust of what we wanted to do was to establish a research center that would, that would both foster reliable scholarship and secondarily, though of equal importance, disseminate that scholarship to as wide an audience as possible. It was during, uh, it was that five year period, roughly 1986 to 1991, when Plagues was formally established, uh, that was the actual seedling ground for the center, that five year period. Uh, and I have to say at the top, to put it bluntly, uh, that those years were really a, a, an obstacle course in alternating despair and ecstasy. Uh, again, some of which I, I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, to, to really accurately discuss uh, the origins of Clegg's, I would in fact have to go back uh, as far as 1973 when a group of us organized the Gay Academic Union, uh, and that union lasted for a couple of years, though it was subverted largely by conservative uh, white male scholars. Uh, but our inaugural conference, the Universities and the Gay Experience, uh, was a major event. Uh, it's hard for you I think most of you anyway, to understand the amount of fear and trepidation most people felt in academia and out uh, in attending, let alone actually signing up for uh, that first conference, the universities and the gay experience. There was even a bomb scare at one point, and the entire conference uh, had to spill into the streets while the police went through the seats to make sure it was only a scare and not the real thing. I won't linger on those years, uh, simply because there isn't time, uh, but I feel I should at least give you a few snapshots from the 70s, uh, the dark ages as it were, if for no other reason than to paraphrase Santayana, uh, those, um, um, messing it up, I, I can tell already, that, that th those who don't know the past uh, are destined to repeat it. Throughout the decade of the 70s, the gay political movement receded rapidly uh, from its post-Stonewall radical period, uh, the period of the Gay Liberation Front above all, uh, and then subsequently the somewhat more conservative uh, gay academic, not gay academic union, a gay activist alliance. Uh, during those years of the 70s, lesbian separatism was at its height. People of color were largely unseen and unwelcome in gay organizations, and prosperous gay white males generally mocked the movement as unchic. Uh, literally using that phrase. They wanted nothing to do with uh, all these uh, <coughs> scrawny people uh, from the East Village uh, who were making life difficult for them in terms of uh, enjoying the discos uh, uh, and the sex bars, neither of which I have anything against. <laughs> uh, if we look at the national climate on the eve of the, the outbreak of AIDS uh, in the late 70s, it was in fact drenched in homophobia. To give you again just a few examples, 
1973, uh, the same year the Gay Academic Union held its inaugural conference, Los Angeles Police Chief Ed Davis spoke out publicly against extending civil rights to gay people, referring to us as, quote, predatory creatures. In 1974, the famed Chicago Daily News columnist Mike Royko wrote a column about what he called Banana Lib, an organization he told his readers of, quote, men in love with monkeys who are suddenly coming out of the cage. In 1976, the Pope described homosexuality as, quote, a serious depravity with the Archdiocese of New York, headed by Cardinal O'Connor, uh, proudly and successfully leading the fight against the pending civil rights ordinance, uh, an ordinance that would have extended rights to what Cardinal O'Connor called, quote, the sinful and unnatural sexually disoriented. The Toronto police raided the offices of Canada's leading gay publication, The Body Politic. Vandals ransacked the feminist Diana Press in Oakland. And Florida Governor Ruben Askew, who had a liberal reputation, announced that he would not want a known homosexual teaching his children. During the early 70s, I had shifted my own work as a scholar uh, which had previously been focused on slavery and anti-slavery, uh, I shifted it to uh, researching and writing gay history. And here, too, it was a steep uphill battle. Uh, in those years, uh, trying to convince the so-called liberal academic world that gay studies was, in fact, a legitimate enterprise uh, was very close to being hopeless. <clears throat> Again, just a few snapshots for you. In 1974, along with Dennis Rubini, an openly gay historian at Temple, I submitted a proposal for a panel on the history of sexual behavior, nothing so controversial, mind you, as the history of lesbian and gay uh, sexual behavior. Uh, I submitted the proposal to the program committee of the annual convention of the American Historical Association. And then we waited, and waited, no word. Finally, uh, we inquired what had happened to our proposal. The reply came back, uh, they have no idea what we're talking about the proposal must have gotten unaccountably lost. Undaunted, we resubmitted the proposal the following year. This time there was no evasion. We were turned down quickly and cold. To compound the insult, the AHA newsletter published an article entitled Undoing History, in which it mocked Dennis and me for protesting the paucity of gay history offerings on the university level, and jovially assured us that the paucity was due simply to, quote, the fact that the history of this and other sexual minorities is unimportant, period. Tenacious by nature, uh, we next tried to get a pro-gay studies resolution uh, in other words, simply a resolution uh, asserting that our, scholar, our scholarly interests and the whole field of gay studies <coughs> was feasible, uh, not to say necessary. We didn't expect the necessary, but we did expect at least the feasible. However, that pro-gay studies resolution was rejected by a lopsided vote and the AHA's executive director contacted me and, and, and haughtily challenged me to document my charges, which he didn't believe for a second, that discrimination against gay people existed in hiring and promotion. 
In fact, hard evidence was difficult to come by. But the reason it was difficult to come by was not because discrimination wasn't happening, but because many academics, liberal academics, as they like to think of themselves, and this is true down to the present day, <coughs> excuse me, many academics simply aren't in touch with their own homophobia. They prefer to believe that they're entirely free of prejudice of all kinds, uh, which is a form of denial that, of course, women and people of color have long been familiar with. Even when conscious of their prejudice, which was unusual, most liberal academics were and are far too clever uh, to openly cite as their reason for firing or failing to promote somebody uh, the candidate's sexual orientation. Instead, what they cite are such things as insufficient publications, uh, poor quality of teaching, insufficient citizenship. I remember one that literally said a lack of good citizenship, and so on. To give an example of another kind during these same years, I tried to get CUNY to include sexual orientation uh, in the anti-discrimination clause of its labor contracts, and the vice chancellor vetoed the proposal out of hand wouldn't even allow me an audience in order to argue the case. An even more protracted struggle developed within the CUNY Graduate School. Yes, the very site of our gathering today. When I was appointed a distinguished professor in 1972, I was asked to teach here at the Graduate School. Uh, I had been teaching graduate students at Princeton, and I said I was frankly tired of it, that graduate students were, to my mind, uh, too dutiful. Uh, that they tended to write down everything I said as if it was truth, <laughs> the capital T. And that, at least for the time being, I said I would prefer to confine my teaching to uh, CUNY's undergraduate campus at Lehman in the Bronx. Though I did say uh, that I would sit on PhD orals uh, and also advise PhD theses. <clears throat> a very few years later, two or three years, uh, when my interest in the history of sexuality uh, began, uh, I, I told the Graduate Center that I would be willing, after all, to teach here. Uh, I wanted to get feedback from students uh, who had a richer background uh, on the subject and on uh, contextual matters that related to it. Uh, the seminar I suggested, of course, was the history of sexuality. Again, not anything as explosive as the history of gay and lesbian sexuality. Just the proposal of the history of sexuality brought down a storm of indignation, and I am not exaggerating. The history uh, I proposed, I was told, was not legitimate history at all. The subject had been spawned by political polemics, not scholarly necessity. And my own involvement in such a non-subject, it was made clear, uh, necessarily brought my objectivity as a scholar into serious question, as if, as if scholarly objectivity uh, is an actual fact rather than a highly problematic <coughs> suggestion. I was furious, uh, and I told the history department that since I was now considered contaminated by them, no longer a legitimate scholar, obviously they would not want me to be in contact with their students. And so henceforth, I said, uh, I would no longer advise PhD candidates, nor would I sit on PhD orals. And I held to that resolve from 1975 through to 1991, when Clegg's won formal approval uh, as a graduate school center. 
At that point, I did offer a seminar on gay and lesbian history, politics, and culture. Uh, and the history department predicted they were certain uh, that not enough students would sign up for it to warrant uh, offering the course at all. At most, they said I'd get four or five students. In fact, 45 <laughs> turned up. Uh, and the result was that I had to uh, split the group into two seminars uh, and do one of them at night because I certainly didn't want to turn anybody away. Uh, not in those early years of trying to get the field established. So yes, there is a long, long backstory to my 1986 invitation to friends to meet in my apartment uh, and try to uh, talk about setting up uh, a gay research center. <clears throat> by that time, by 1986, uh, Academic officialdom had become more sympathetic. They weren't, they didn't prove entirely uneducable. Uh, but that doesn't mean that winning approval was anything remotely like a slam dunk. Uh, it took five full years, uh, and these were years filled not with occasional meetings. Uh, or random efforts, but solid, sustained work uh, on various grounds. Again, I can only give you a few glimpses into the kinds of issues that arose during those five years, but I should point out that there were difficulties not only with the graduate school officialdom, but there were also difficulties linked to intense infighting that sometimes erupted within our, own, within our own organizing committee, as we called ourselves. Uh, the first major battle within our own small group of fellow LGBT scholars uh, involved the notion, the original notion, of trying to interest Yale uh, in CLAGS, in what became CLAGS. Uh, the only reason I think the idea came up at all uh, was simply because uh, I happened to know, I was, I was good friends with the wife of the man uh, who had just been appointed Yale's new president, Benno Schmidt. Uh, and I sounded Benno out uh, about whether the, you know, there was even a remote possibility at Yale uh, and you know, he expressed some guarded interest, but said that before he be actually became president, uh, he would have to do some soundings. Uh, the women on our committee, uh, and we always stuck to the principle of gender parity, the women of our committee were leery about Yale from the first. Uh, they never felt it was a good idea, even if, in fact, uh, it turned out to be a possibility. For them, it was a toss-up between being attracted to Yale as a prestigious legitimizing agency and repugnance to Yale as a traditional dispenser of elite male privilege. Uh, the women were right, <laughs> as the subsequent story played out and proved. Uh, Benno, the incoming president, sounded out the presiding president, Bart Giamatti, uh, later commissioner of baseball, and yes, the father of Paul Giamatti. Uh, Bart immediately objected to establishing anything that had the word gay in its title. He called it, quote, an advocacy word. And he said ad ad advocacy was anathema to the scholarly pursuit of truth. <laughs> it's hard to believe uh, now, 25, 30 years later, uh, though it still is out there, uh, if perhaps not to the same degree. Through Benno, I argued back uh, that black, as in black studies, might also be considered an advocacy word. But would Bart insist 
that a black study center be called a center devoted to research on colored people? <laughs> Besides, some people have a right to name themselves. At that point, Bart shifted the argument. He told Benno that he might consider such a center if it was devoted to the broad topic of the history of sexuality. Benno asked me what I thought about the, the possibility, and I said, absolutely not. The Kinsey Institute already existed uh, and had plenty of grant money for research. Uh, what was needed was not another center for human sexuality, but rather a research center for lesbian and gay studies. At that point, a prominent Yale on our own organizing committee, uh, the well-known historian John Boswell, uh, stood up at one of our small meetings and he said, uh, he felt the need to warn us, uh, and his tone was huffy, he felt the need to warn us uh, that if Yale was interested, it would, rightly in his view, mandate what our guidelines would be. Immediately, several of the women in our group challenged Boswell, uh, and they told him that in trying to legitimize gay studies, we needed to be very sure that a rapprochement with traditional academia did not end up in an accommodation to its norms rather than ours. I was on their side of the debate, as were several of the other men, uh, and all of the women in our group. Outflanked, Boswell resigned from our committee and did not resign quietly. He promptly sent Benno Schmidt a letter, a long letter, uh, which he cc'd me on, uh, denouncing our committee as, quote, grudgingly envious of Yale, uh, and he urged Benno to reject the center. Benno said to me, his own relief apparent, uh, Marty, I can't proceed without Yale's gay star. Uh, and that was that. And thus we shifted to CUNY. Uh, and in fact, CUNY made much more sense as a resting place for us from the very beginning. From the start, uh, uh, I think this is the kind of thing that uh, will, uh, will, will help you uh, understand uh, why today CLAGS is, in comparison to our other national organizations, uh, legitimately known as progressive. Uh, from the very start, uh, I viewed Cleggs, and I was not alone, I viewed Cleggs as an agent of social change. Uh, I viewed its mission as not only intellectual, but also political. In fact, I saw the center as a kind of Trojan horse you know, stealthily making its way uh, into the academic enclosure and then laying waste to the dominant ideology on gender and sexuality uh, that currently dominated the culture and to a large extent still does. I firmly believed at the time, and I still firmly believe, despite the assimilationist mode which is everywhere, that we have much to tell the mainstream world. Uh, they think that at best they might extend tolerance to us, but from my perspective, at the best, we will share with them some of the special insights and values uh, that we have garnered as a result of our highly unique historical experience. The mainstream, and I believe, I hope I'm wrong, but I believe that the majority of LGBT people 
share these uh, platitudinous perceptions. Uh, the mainstream continues to believe that the one true path to happiness, indeed to a moral life, is the traditional path of pair-bonded couples of opposite binary uh, genders uh, committed to monogamy and to raising pink or blue babies. <laughs> To fulfill the mission I had in mind, I felt that Clegg's had to exemplify from the beginning, in its own structure, the kind of change it hoped to foster in the culture at large. That meant, as I emphasized from the start, uh, and didn't have to do much persuading, uh, that meant that Clegg's had to be based on the principle of gender parity had to represent diverse racial and ethnic groups, and as well, a range of disciplines and communities, including independent scholars without university affiliations. I hoped further that although queer theory was then only in its infancy, that its dense language would not prevent us from recognizing its crucial, import, crucially important message. Namely, that gender and sexuality not be viewed, as is still commonly the case, as fixed entities, but rather treated as potentially fluid, malleable, and unstable. This is not to deny, uh, on the other hand, that for some, perhaps many individuals, and this, and this comes up to the present day as well, uh, that for many, uh, their current gender and sexual reality brings down on their heads real, not imagined, brutality and violence. In trying to get gay studies institutionalized, I was aware from the beginning that we ran the danger of trying to fix in place an identity which was in fact changeable and might even be transient. I had long wrestled with that issue my, with myself and a few friends, and on the eve of setting flags in motion, I summarized my troubled thoughts in a journal that I then kept. <clears throat> Quote, I've begun to wonder whether the whole emphasis on identity, sexual or otherwise, isn't at bottom a strategy for delimiting our options as human beings, which is itself part of the general plague of over-categorizing experience, of the endemic insistence that we choose, that we agree to become one thing, gay or straight, <coughs> male or female. I believe, continuing, uh, that identity po politics is necessary troubled though some of us still are about the inability of overarching categories or labels like black or gay to represent accurately the multiple and often overlapping identities that relate to ethnicity, <clears throat> class, and race and that in fact characterize individual lives. I thought then, and I, <clears throat> I thought then, and I still think, that uh, it's right to remain uncomfortable <laughs> about referring to the gay community as if it was one homogenous unit rather than a hothouse of contradictions, a universe of conflicting priorities and agendas. On the other hand, in order to form and build a political movement, <clears throat> LGBT people, in my view, <clears throat> need to emphasize a shared, they need to emphasize what they share in common, uh, not the many ways in which they may be different one from the other. Uh, they need to emphasize especially a shared relationship to the dominant white male power structure and to heteronormativity. It remains true as that, that as soon as we factor in diverse cultural, class, and racial loyalties, 
we necessarily do complicate the picture, along with being better able to appreciate the difficulty that many individuals have in establishing a hierarchy of <coughs> obligations and allegiances. Nonetheless, by emphasizing what we have in common, our resistance to the powers that, the established powers that be, we not only cement our own community bonds, but are also led, at least potentially, into solidarity with other marginalized groups. Again, I tried to spell out my, my conflicted feelings about all this in another journal, journal entry, <clears throat> which I made when I stepped down as Clegg's executive director in 1996. <coughs> Quote, <clears throat> one holds on to a group identity despite its insufficiency, insufficiencies, because for most non-mainstream people, it's the closest we've ever gotten to having a political home and voice. Yes, identity politics reduces and simplifies. Yes, it's a kind of prison. But it's also, paradoxically, a haven. It's at once confining and empowering. And in the absence of alternate havens, group identity will, for many, remain the appropriate site of resistance and the main source of comfort. Critics of identity politics often employ high-flown rhetoric uh, and hector us about the need to transcend our parochial allegiances and to unite with them behind uh, enlightenment principles based on rationality uh, to become, as one of them has put it, quote, universal human beings with universal rights. But to me, that injunction rings hollow and hypocritical. It's difficult to march into the sunset as a civil community with a universalist culture when the legitimacy of our different, differentness as minorities has not been more than superficially acknowledged, let alone safeguarded. You cannot link arms under a universalist banner when you can't find your own name on it. A minority identity may be contingent or incomplete, but that does not make it fabricated or needless. And cultural unity must never be purchased at the cost of cultural erasure. To turn now, how am I doing on time? Five, ten minutes. Five or ten minutes. Five or ten? Five or ten more? Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I haven't told you anything about those five years. Okay. Uh, two minutes for those five, the five years of trouble. Uh, did, I, I, I want to make it clear, which I haven't up to now, I want to make it clear that we did have from the very beginning strong allies here at the CUNY Graduate School. This was not simply a hotbed of homophobia. Uh, among those uh, allies were two consecutive presidents, Harold Pershansky uh, and Francis Deegan Horowitz. Uh, in fact, when, when our delegation first went to Harold Pershansky uh, to see if the Graduate School might be interested in us, uh, he welcomed us. Uh, he said, this is long overdue. I'm so glad you've come to us. We will make this happen. But, he said, you have to raise a minimum of $50,000 before I can present you to the Board of Trustees. Uh, you have to prove, in other words, that you are viable as a center. And he said, now, you know, you academics, I know you. Uh, you don't know a thing about money. You pretend not to care about it, but it's certainly true you don't know anything about it. Uh, he said, so I'm going to help you. Uh, every college president has a slush fund. I'm going to go to five of them that I trust, and I'm going to ask each one for $5,000 uh, from their slush funds. That will give you uh, half of your budget. Uh, and surely even you can raise the other half. Uh, he was a very true ally. Ah, we were thrilled. We 
thought, oh my God, we've got $25 in the bank already and we're barely begun. We were thrilled, that is, until the next day when Prashansky called me, his tone very gloomy, to say that <clears throat> he had run his plan to go to the president's past CUNY's chancellor, who was then Joseph Murray, uh, a very well-known and well-regarded liberals. Never trust liberals. <laughs> <laughs> and Joseph Murphy had said, and these are the words I wrote down in my, my journal at the time, no way. I won't formally oppose the establishment of this center, but nor will I, or you, Brzezinski, lift a finger to help it get established. So much for liberals, so much for any help in raising uh, our 50,000. We tried turning to the foundation world. It was very different back then than it is currently. Uh, there were very few gay funding agencies. Uh, wealthy gay, gay donors uh, would, you know, we, we considered a large check to be $100. Uh, and occasionally a wealthy gay donor would send us such a check. But basically they did not get it. What they did not get, what they did not understand, and to this day many do not, is that the production and dissemination of reliable scholarship is an essential form of activism. It provides the needed reservoir of knowledge with which we change the social climate uh, and social values. Sorry, I, uh, I lost a note, a note here. Uh, it, in other words, what, what, what I'm saying is that but, but very few people got it. Uh, in order to challenge discriminatory attitudes and laws, we have to do uh, what scholars of race did. Uh, the Brown versus Board Supreme Court decision uh, based its arguments for desegregation on recent scholarly work on race. And we had to do exactly the same thing uh, in regard to sexual orientation and gender. So, for five years what we did was, you know, we passed the hat every time we did an event, and we did many of them, uh, and we inaugurated a very low fee membership drive, which is why it took us a full five years to raise $50,000. Even after we were established in 1991, uh, we were not assigned an office for 10 months. Uh, finally, I was so angry about it, uh, my own office in the graduate school doubled as the Clegg's office. Uh, I finally went to the, to the vice chancellor, who was not an ally, uh, and, I, and I said, we have to have a physical space. Uh, people need to know where to go and need to know that we exist. You know, and he sat back in his Ames chair, his cigar, blew smoke in my face and said, Impossible. Uh, the graduate school simply doesn't have any extra space. And I said, is there any other center at the graduate school that does not have an office? And he had to confess that there wasn't. And at that place, we got an office. But what an office it was. It was more like a dungeon. Uh, when I first walked in there, I could hardly believe it. Uh, it was dark and foreboding. The only window covered with soot, faced out on a brick wall. Uh, the only fluorescent bulb, there are like three fluorescent bulbs in the ceiling that actually lit up. Uh, electric wires, happily not live, uh, were scattered all across the ratty rug, and our furniture consisted entirely of one desk, one chair, and two filing cabinets. There was, during this difficult five-year period, uh, a definite downside. We were not, you know, the ideal loving community of scholars. Uh, sometimes it was more like an academic version of gang warfare. Uh, but I will spare you all of that. 
because I am running out of time and I do need to fulfill my obligation to deal with uh, the second item on the agenda, namely my, my hopes for Clancy's future. I guess my, my future hopes for Clegg's go something like this. That we insist that we do not and will not buy into the movement's current insistence that we're just folks. Nor will we devote our energy and resources to helping groups like the Human Rights Campaign, which many people wrongly equate with the movement, mm -hmm. uh, will not help them implement their assimilationist agenda. It's an agenda that misrepresents both who we are to ourselves and also misrepresents us to the mainstream. Gay people are not carbon copy straight people, just as black people are not carbon copy white people. Our unique experience has provided us with unique insights and perspectives. 40 years ago, sorry, 60 years ago, Herbert Marcuse in his book Eros and Civilization wrote, quote, homosexuals might one day provide a cutting edge social critique of vast importance. It's precisely the absence of that cutting edge critique that currently characterizes our national organizations. Clags much less than most, I'm very happy to say. In my view, what we need to do more of is to reassert or assert for the first time uh, more, more vigorously than we currently are our real subcultural values, and they are multiple. Uh, a couple of very quick examples. There are many ways in which we are genuinely, importantly different from the mainstream. In our refusal, for example, to buy into the binary notion, uh, that the two genders uh, have certain biological traits that adhere to them, that women are intrinsically emotional, that men are intrinsically aggressive. Many also, I mean, these are just a couple of examples thrown out at random uh, because I'm rushed, but multiple studies have shown that gay men put a much greater emphasis on emotional expressiveness and sexual innovation than do straight men. They also show that lesbians as a group are far more independent-minded and far less subservient to authority than our straight women. Our relationships, moreover, are characterized far more by mutuality and egalitarianism. We at least aim at equality in our unions rather than privileging one partner's personal, sexual, and career needs over the others. Not only have our national organizations failed to challenge mainstream American values, they've also ignored the actual needs of most gay people. And this will be my last point, I promise. <laughs> Though you would never know it from the current agenda, most gay people are working class. <laughs> And that's true whether class is defined by income, educational level, or job status. And the chief concern of gay working class people these days is finding a job with decent wages and benefits. 46 million Americans, including obviously some who are gay, subsist on food stamps, an increase of 14 million over the past four years. A quarter of blacks and Latinos in this country, including some who are gay, are living below the poverty line, which is an appalling $22,000 a year for a family of four. One in every five children goes to bed hungry at night. One in every four adult black men is either in jail or has recently been released from it, often for some minor drug charge. And yes, some of them are gay. 20 individuals in the United States have more combined wealth than the bottom half 
of the population, 20 individuals. 91% of the nation's income growth, or much heralded growth, from 2008 to 2011 went to the top 1%. These are all our issues. Our own people demand that we address them far more than our national organizations have in the past or in the present. On the local level, there are some struggling LGBT organizations whose mission is centered on dealing with the plight of our own poor. Here in New York City, for example, I was part of one such group, uh, Queers for Economic Justice. Uh, and mo most of our work was directed toward gay people living in shelters. Uh, Queers for Economic Justice had to close its door last year's doors. Uh, we had a meager, tiny budget, and yet we couldn't meet it. Whereas the Human Rights Campaign Fund has a budget, an annual budget, in the multi-millions. My hope for CLAGS, in other words, is that it will increasingly turn its, intent, its attention to the suffering lot of many of our own people. How about a major conference, for example, on the gay poor? that, and I would certainly love to be part of it. So in sum, a life of scholarship is a worthy life, but it seems to me it becomes even more so when its privileged practitioners use their knowledge and influence to address injustice across the board, not simply in its own backyard. Clags, in my opinion, has always done better in this regard than have most of our organizations. Over a 30-year period, we have made it abundantly clear to a multitude of doubters that LGBT scholarship is a vital instrument for producing social change. We have done much good work in the world. My hope is that Clags will continue to, will continue to remain part of the solution not part of the problem, and I feel confident that it will.